You're listening to Neo Cash Radio. We discuss the future of money today in the studio with you. It's JJ, Darren, and Randy. It's another episode of What is Bitcoin? Venezuela is in grave danger of becoming a dictatorship. The cold golem rises. All this and more on episode 201 here on Wednesday, April 5th, 2017. Yes, so uh, JJ, in the traditional markets to th- this week, we've got uh, gold ho- holding s- steady just over uh, $1,200, $1,230 or $53. Uh, silver's up to $18.25. Oil's up to $51.10. And the Dow is up to 20,755 points. And the 30 year treasury is yielding a, uh, 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 it's up to, and yielding 3%. Thanks, Darren. And in the crypto markets, we've got Bitcoin up to $1,124. Litecoin is way up to $11.65. Ethereum is down to $45.13. Dash is down to $74.26. Zcash is down to $58.81. And Monero is down to $19.90. Thanks, Randy. And just a reminder that you can tune into Neocache Radio every Wednesday night. Don't want to miss a single moment of awesome Neocache content, including special episodes and bonus interviews. Subscribe to our podcast on Google Play Music, iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, YouTube, Podcast Addict, LBRY, and more. All the places. All the places and all the things. And retweet uh, all the things. So starting out, there's a lot to talk about, but I just want to mention right away that Pedro is joining us once again, Pedro. Hey, thanks for having me on again. Yeah, awesome. It's always good to have you on. And and maybe, you know, eventually, Pedro, if you keep coming, we're just going to include you in that whole... Uh, intro thing. You could be and, and Pedro. Yeah, and Pedro. Pa- <laughs> Randy, Randy's going to lose the and then, <laughs> or with Pedro. Oh, featuring. Wow, wow exactly. Well, starting out, we're going to uh, an update. Now we've talked about Venezuela's issues for a long time here on Neocash Radio, and you can go back to our website at neocashradio.com, and you can listen to all the ones where we have uh, basically clued you in on on what's happening uh, with now. Uh, in the past, so we talk about the future of money. Well, the future of money in Venezuela is not doing so well. President uh, Maduro is close to dictatorship. Since our last show, the situation in Venezuela has intensified. Venezuela's Supreme Court is filled with Maduro party loyalists and last week issued a ruling regarding the opposition-led legislature effectively dissolving the government body. Following the international outrage over the decision, the Supreme Court has revised its decision, but the damage has been done. Just as the South American country is poised for a dictatorship, new data shows that Venezuela has inflated its currency by over 200% since this time last year. Right now, there are 13.3 trillion bolivars in circulation. And Dollar Today, the site that the Venezuelan government has sued to get shut down and has failed to do so because it's in the United States, lists the the exchange exchange rates to be at 4,201 bolivars to a single U.S. dollar. That's just huge. Well, so, and what's going on with the reserves? Yeah, so the, the Venezuelan reserves are down to about $10.5 billion. Now, this is one of the most oil-rich countries in the world. And they, they can't, they can't, right now, the, there is really nothing productive happening. And it's it seems like all they're doing is burning through those reserves. So once that's done, I don't I don't know what's left. You know what I'm saying? Like, they can't buy anything. They can't pay anyone. Yeah, so to collapse collapse that's what's left they should have i think it'd be better if they collapsed already right um i mean they're... well the good i mean the good news of this story is that the outrage from both internally as well as internationally with the the supreme court's declaration uh really pushed sort of pushed back some of this this momentum that maduro has has gained but it it just seems like a losing battle it doesn't seem like the government of venezuela can get its act together well, they were sending in uh, government agents to the bakeries to find out why they weren't baking bread or enough bread. And it yeah. comes to find out the reason was they don't have enough flour. So, so so when you can't bake enough bread or have enough toilet paper on the aisles, you know, and you've only got limited reserves, then, you know, things yeah. have to happen. Yeah, that's right. Well, so that's an update there. I, I really don't know... <laughs> I don't, I, you know, whatever has to happen next, it's, it's basically like, I, I don't see how they can solve this problem with Maduro in his current seat, you know, as yeah. president. Well, the Venezuelan people will have to, you know, figure what their path forward is. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a difficult decision. to be working. Yeah. 
Well, and I'm, I'm going to make sure to put a link in the blog post uh, from today, linking back to uh, the last episode where we talked about this episode 184 and just uh, what's been going on with Bitcoin in Venezuela, how that's seen a massive surge, but uh, also the dangers that have arisen as a result from people mining Bitcoin. Uh, we talked a little bit about people using these really unique ways to use Bitcoin to buy Amazon things and have them delivered to their homes or going across the border um, because their money was becoming devalued rapidly and there were people that they had to start making larger denomination bills. Uh, they were weighing money out on scales rather than counting it because it was faster. Uh, so these are the kinds of things that ha- can happen with fiat currency and with centrally controlled banks. And uh, this is why people are desperately looking for, for other options. Yeah, in fact, uh, one story I had read is that they're using something called Rare Pepe. It's like a, there's an online trading card game, and, and one of the cards apparently is this Rare Pepe, and it's worth... It's, and if you can find the right buyer, of course, someone who knows about this, then it's worth value that you can tra- trade for goods and services. Or Bitcoin. Right. And it's it's sort of a way around the Bitcoin situation, too. So... Uh, moving on, it's our favorite game. I know, Darren, you love to play this game. We've been playing it for years. Yeah, what is Bitcoin? Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Randy, what is Bitcoin? Well, Japan now recognizes Bitcoin as a legal method of payment. So they're still not calling it a currency. They're not calling it money. Uh, those things. What does it mean? Well, that need you have to have something that issues it is what they say uh, for money. So um, this new law that passed defines Bitcoin and other virtual currencies as a form of payment method, not a legally recognized currency. So they're considering it like an asset similar to what the United States and the IRS do. Uh, do. Um, if you profit from trading Bitcoin, they say that it can be considered income from business activities, and they believe that it's subject to capital gains tax as a result. Uh, however, the purchase and sale of Bitcoins and other digital currencies is no longer subject to Japan's 8% consumption tax starting July 1st of this year. Well, that's good. So simply buying or selling it won't uh, yeah, won't put you out to pay some sort of mandatory tax. I mean, does this does this seem like the right way to go with, uh, you know, that's, that's the question is the right way to go. Like, there is a single right way to go. Darren, I mean, does this make sense for what, for, for creating it like an asset rather than... I think it makes sense for tax purposes, definitely. Okay. I think it doesn't make sense to have different branches of the government classify it different ways. That doesn't make sense. Right. But an asset for tax purposes makes, a, I think that makes a lot of sense. So is that more like how they would classify gold? Yeah. Okay. So, like, like it's a precious metal yeah. treated the same way as a precious metal. Yeah. Yeah. Or even a st- stock or something like that. I mean, a stock's considered a security, but technically, it's an asset. So. Okay. There you go. Well, and Japan's got to be careful. They've got Mount Gox. Oh yeah, they've the, gotten goxed. Yeah. So, for anyone sort of newer to the cryptocurrency sphere, there was a massive Bitcoin uh, exchange hack that resulted in lots and lots of yeah. M- gone bitcoin yeah i was actually reading about that he uh the the person that ran that exchange blamed it on a malleability attack mark carpellis yeah and i just read a paper where they published um their uh monitoring of this uh this attack the malleability attack Mm -hmm. and uh they they determined that uh you know the malleability attack could have accounted for at most 300 or 800 bitcoins and uh and, uh, you know, Capellus lost thousands of Bitcoins. So there's still, you know, tens of thousands of Bitcoins that still he needs to explain where they went. Yeah. And the investigation is, is still ongoing there. This is, happened in 2013, 2014. Yeah. I don't remember off the top of my head, but uh, certainly th- this was just after Bitcoin had reached its alt- then all time high of around eleven hundred, twelve hundred dollars Yep. And it crashed fantastically now, now, uh, t- to be fair yes. I, that hi- that all-time high could have easily been manipulated by the trading bots that that mark was running as well right yeah. he was running he known known to run two different trading bots in, in his own okay his right. own exchange and, and at the time that you know there wasn't a lot of depth to the bitcoin market you know sure. there were very few exchanges so you know a few people but, with lots yes, of it bitcoin. Was a high, yeah yeah well, yes, certainly uh, if for anyone newer to the cryptosphere, definitely look into what, what happened with Mt. Gox. Learn, learn, learn you some history like, like all of us have been doing in our own ways. Um, so Japan is now tightening, um, n- not just tightening down on customers, but to on exchanges as well. Uh, customers are going to be subjected to a lot more know your customer and anti-money, anti-money Jesus. That's okay, Randy. <laughs> anti-money laundering uh, requirements. So they're going to have to 
If you want to open an account with a Bitcoin exchange, you're going to have to answer a list of questions that weren't previously asked. You're going to have to uh, list your profession, your purpose for trading. You have to upload identification documents. You have to wait for the exchange to process them. And then the exchange will actually send a postcard to the registered address of that you give them with a verification code that wow. you have to enter online. And the exchanges themselves uh, have some new regulatory requirements. They have to hold at minimum liquid capital of about 10 million of 10 million yen, which is worth around 90,000 US. And uh, they have to prove that they have a sufficient IT system management program uh, with measures in place to prevent leakage, loss of damage of funds and personal information. So Wow. That's really thorough, I must say. I, I was just waiting for you to say that the exchangers must have a pint of blood on, on hand <laughs> for, for, each, it's like, for each employee. For, no, no, for each customer. You got to yeah. send one in and then yeah. we DNA need to samples. revive you with this blood in case. Well, with all of that, just days after this announcement, two Japanese leading Japanese retailers, Bic Camera and Recruit Lifestyle, announced that they would begin accepting Bitcoin. And between those two retailers, they have a combined two hundred and sixty thousand plus outlets across Japan. Wow! So, so, so this whole block size thing really needs to get fixed quick. Uh, I would say so. Segwit. There we go. Anyway, uh, you know what? There's a lot of other things. Thank you for that, Randy. It's it's always great. Uh, to, speaking to play of the segwit. game, to play the game of yeah, so what is Bitcoin? Speaking of Segwit, well, the, w- there what has been happening with Litecoin? It's just, so, it's, so we we, we, de- we delisted Litecoin yeah. from our show <laughs> notes, and, and and it was at about four dollars. We stopped reporting the price because it yes. had stayed so steady for so long. So long, high threes, low fours. Yes. Yep. So uh, now it's at the eleventh. So and, w- uh, it's gonna is Litecoin going to implement Segwit? Uh, it it actually looks that way. I'm. I'm pulling this up, and seventy uh, percent of the blocks mined in the last uh, day have uh, signaled for Segwit. Now, is this this is very recent? Yes. Okay, so so let me let, now. We don't speculate on the show, so this is what this is my difficulty of like. Well, we were we were like, what's what's happening with Litecoin? And so one idea, of course, is well, that well, Bitcoin's having trouble, right? Yes. So people are looking for somewhere else to go, else, else to go, and. Uh, uh, one thing that Litecoin has done is said they're going to implement SegWit. So they've they've basically ported the cur- code over from Bitcoin Core and put it on their client, and uh, and there and then miners can signal for SegWit. Now is now there was a point in time when Ethereum. Oh, when I'm sorry, Ethereum. I'm getting ahead of myself here. Litecoin was mined with Dogecoin. Right? Yeah. They, so they both the, the same. Yeah, I think that still can happen. You can still it's merged mining. It's, merge mining, it's, right? It should still be that way. So each block that Litecoin mines, a Dogecoin block is also mined. Yeah, I think miners have a choice between mining Litecoin or mining Dogecoin and Litecoin. And you there's so there's been a recent rise in Dogecoin, is right? Oh yeah, there's been a, a severe. Rise in Dogecoin uh, from like twenty satoshis to thirty some satoshis. Woo! So yeah. sending so my kids to college. Now I like, I really like the idea of Litecoin being the Segwit test bed. I think it's smart to to see it implemented, especially Litecoin's been around a long time, and they've made a big change with that that merged mining. Mm-hmm. They made a, a a few other things, but for the most part, as we've said, the price has been stable, the coin's been stable. Mm-hmm. It just isn't that interesting. It's sort of like vanilla. It's like, uh you know, and and to and to initiate the change, it has to uh, be above seventy five percent for at least two weeks. Okay, and it has to stay that way. Um, so if it if it drops below that, I think it resets a counter. So they they need to see it above seventy five percent, and and stay that way for. Well, two this weeks. would give this would give Bitcoin Core the proof of concept they need to maybe push more support for the the Bitcoin Segwit. Yeah, that that could be. So, uh, I mean, it, either way, the block size and the transaction throughput per time unit needs to be fixed. Mm-hmm. And, you know, like... So SegWit would help because it uh, basically changes the accounting of how big a block is. I think but, I think we're at the point out a way to, to try to get their own fork out of this. You know, to, to not implement SegWit. I'm, I'm not sure. A lot of the players in the unlimited space say they're going to go with the longest chain and uh, the SegWit space basically says they're going to go with SegWit. So, um... Wow. Do you think unlimited would go, would uh, uh, update their code with SegWit if they saw that's what was happening? Oh, I, I think that definitely would be the case. It just seems that since they've already got unlimited out, you wouldn't want to change the code 
while it's in production uh, to to bring in Segwit as well. It's, it, it seems like that, you know, first make the box bigger, then bring in Segwit would be uh, the way. The Bitcoin's got a huge market cap, and I I think if it does split it, very quickly, one coin will dominate because no one wants to be you know left holding a coin that's worth pennies. No, no, it, but you know, we, let's look at what happened with Ethereum. Now, obviously, we're not talking about a thousand dollar coin here, but there were there were the hold there were this. Just like we have here with Bitcoin, you have those staunch holdouts that believe ide- ideologically this way, and I think you're going to have the same thing happen. I think you're going to have two coins, and yes, one might be uh, a vastly underperforming compared to the other as far as the price is concerned, but I think that the the overall networks will come out to be two healthy networks. I think given enough time, that's possible. I mean, that's what happened with Ethereum when they did their sure split. But there, th- there is one difference. So Ethereum is more mined by individuals or individuals with small, little, you know, mining rigs. But you're right. Bitcoin has you know huge corporate miners, and some of those corporate miners are ideologically behind Segwit, and some are ideologically behind I'm bigger learning. blocks. Yeah. So but they, if, they if also have a isn't lot to have a bigger block then it's, yeah, they'll be like, yeah, let's do that. But they also have a lot to lose making the wrong decision. So well, that's it's true it's going to be interesting. Yeah, but I, I, you're right. I, I, there's nothing that could surprise me in this space anymore. Well, I mean, and so if they're calling it Bitcoin unlimited, um what is to stop the ability to also let miners uh signal bl- wanting to accept segwit blocks i don't know i don't know what i'm talking about so i'm asking is uh, would it be possible for, for bitcoin unlimited to also support any segwit b- blocks in addition to allowing up w- to 32 megabytes if blocks? Um, bitcoin unlimited issued different code that had the segwit support in it uh then uh then yes but yeah, it, I, the, I, the, se- I, the segwit code drastically alters the way that blocks are stored and 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 read and all that sort of stuff. So, it's it's like to, I mean, it would definitely take a good code base to accept both types of blocks, right? Right. I mean, yeah. I, I mean, mean, ostensibly, the Segwit code should be able to to. I mean, the, the Bitcoin Core code should be able to understand any block that's currently being created. Right. It's not Segwit right now, and then when the Segwit block is created, should be able to understand both of them, right? Right. But it will. I, I believe there are some protocol changes that it won't accept if uh, with the with it won't accept an old block. Okay. So what what happens if there's a stalemate? Neither core nor unlimited can. I think you're going to see all the other <laughs> coins benefit and the price of Bitcoin go down. I mean, <laughs> really, there's no time. There's no, people aren't going to wait around for Bitcoin to get its act together. They, this yeah. really, people are already flipping. This, I think you're right. I mean, people are still talking about. Look at us talking about this t- still now. I know. We should, really, I, it should have happened. We three have years some ago. really fun stuff to talk should've about. Been three years ago. So <laughs> you know let's what? talk about the good stuff. Excellent. You know what, Pedro? You came on the show and you've got a really cool uh, thing you want to talk about. I know we mentioned this a long time ago, back when it was like in its early white paper days. But go ahead with us, Pedro. What do you've got here? Yeah. So this is uh, related to the uh, Ethereum space. So it's a uh, it's a project called Gollum, and uh, Gollum's a global open source and decentralized uh, supercomputer. So it's made of combined power of the users' machines, personal laptops, all the way to data centers. And Gollum is going to use an Ethereum-based transaction system to clear payments between providers, the requesters, and then software developers. Wow. Uh, Gollum is decentralized and scalable. So um, this is all coming from their, from their website. There's uh, no single point of failure and no trusted authority. So um, even though Gollum's capable of connecting millions of nodes using P2P, uh, it's all going to be, you know, um, no no central authority. So here are some of the things that Gollum can be used for. Uh, computer graphics. So Gollum can distribute the task of rendering, you know, complex CGI, doing in minutes what would take days, um, cheaper than, than others. And the competitor would be things like Amazon Web Cloud. Um, business, stock market predictions to, to big data analysis. So uh, speed up business computation and, and lowering costs. So uh, a new business that might want to get into this space doesn't have to you know, invest millions in the data center. Uh, machine learning. Uh, so this is hot in computer science. Um, so it's whether teaching an AI to be a grandmaster or recognize images or human voice patterns or you know, um, things like autonomous driving. Um, you know, this, this is where 
a, a lot of benefit can come from a, a big distributed computer. Sure. Uh, cryptography. So Gollum can run uh, first and largest decentralized cryptocurrency mining pools. So you, you can, you know, one of the functions of Gollum could be to um, you use your computer to mine cryptocurrencies. And it's instead of going to a central pool, you're doing it on, on their network. And then, of course, there's science. And, and from DNA, DNA analysis, protein folding, uh, medical research, you know, searching for alien life forms, you know, SETI, you know, it could be where SETI goes to live. Um, so it's, it's a really exciting project, and I'm, I'm keeping an eye on it. Now, what, what sort of makes Gollum different than the Ethereum virtual machine? I mean, is this, this is a layer on top of it, right? Is it, it's not its own blockchain? It's using Ethereum? So it, it uses tokens on okay. the Ethereum blockchain. So you can buy Gollum tokens, and then you need to pay to run computations. And um, Gollum can do more complex things. So okay. the Ethereum's language isn't, isn't written so that you can write things to do CGI, but Gollum's going to break up and basically send your computer those pieces of code gotcha. and then the data to run, you know, to run the code on. Okay, so so it's it's more refined. Ethereum is more of like a very bare bones, but but very powerful like hydraulic right. system. It, or it ties it all together, and then Go Gollum on top of that has you know sends you work units, and you know essentially you're it's almost like you're running a miner, except instead of just mining cryptography, you you can be doing you know things in science and, and research and, and other fields. So this is something anyone could have running in once it's up and running, could have it running on their computer and someone would be paying basically, right. you could earn uh, Gollum tokens for letting other people use some of your computing power. Right, and the more power you have, and obviously the more efficient power you have, then, you know, the bigger, bigger your profits. Interesting. So and what what I'm trying to wrap my head around, just to, just to understand, is that it, you're you're running this through the Ethereum blockchain. So are you running, like, is this in a Mist browser or something? Is this Gollum like a... Or is so, it a separate? Is it a separate app that just interfaces with the with the Ethereum blockchain? So right right now, what they have is a, a Docker, right? So they have um, you know a, a sandboxed you know software environment with all the, the dependencies. So you would download that. There would be an interface. In fact, they just released a, a Mac interface uh, this week. And what makes it exciting is we all have computers that are vastly more powerful then we really push it for for the most part. You know, unless you're running a high-end gaming rig and, and pushing its limits, you know, you buy a brand new computer and you do word processing and web browsing. Well, it's kind of underused. So sure. you could actually have that running in the background and not really notice. Or, you know, when we go to bed and, you know, leave our computers on or turn them off, then they're not being used. And they're, so there's a lot of computing resources out there that, that are untapped. And, you know, uh, something like, say, for example, medical research, you know, they get some funding. Well, they immediately have funds that they can use to now take off with their research and, and run these massive computations on something that should be cheaper than, you know, things like Amazon Web Cloud or Microsoft Azure. So there's there's the competition. Right. Awesome. Uh, it's It definitely sounds like a way that you can turn your, your computer into a capital, uh, a piece of capital that, that then... You a little lease factory, out, yeah. yeah. You lease out your your clock cycles for some some Gollum, then you can turn that into Ethereum, and Ethereum is doing pretty well right now. So uh, it's really cool, and I look forward to seeing more about what this is being used for and and how people are are making it work. Uh, next up, we have a Dash story here. So there was there was a Dash open house this week, and they you know did a lot of you know I guess discussion about what's going on with Dash. Yep. Yeah, so that uh, happened, I believe, Wednesday, right after our show last week, and uh, it was or it was pretty exciting. Uh, the, uh, Amanda spoke, then Ryan, who's the CFO, and then Evan, and uh, uh, Ryan was, you know, very optimistic and talking about how uh, they're expanding their team and uh, there's just a lot happening uh, to, to get Dash. Uh, all the resources it needs to 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 thrive and um there was also evan uh speaking and he he mentioned uh making a client in the go language which is is something that ethereum's done they have multi uh several implementations of their client in different languages uh so uh, there's some question of that how that is going to work and uh when what the timeline for that will be but um and then there was also a question in this thing about the insta mining. So 
uh, Dash sometimes or maybe often is criticized because at, when it started, uh, they it base it, the mining went quicker than was expected, and it's been branded uh, an insta mine by uh, people who have a negative viewpoint of that. But um, so I I do have the numbers on that. Uh, but but what it, what they what people are meaning when there's insta mine. So basically, when Dash was first launched, the difficulty algorithm how difficult it is to mine a block wasn't quite right. And so the difficulty didn't adjust properly to basically adjust high enough so that the blocks came out slower and therefore the block rewards came out slower. And so the result is at right after the launch of Dash, which was at the, at the time that was called Dark Coin, uh, there were uh, 1.86 million uh, Dark Coin mined in the first day and 2.02 million mined in the first two days. Wow. So that's 2 million mined in the first two days. Now, uh, this is a source of criticism because people are saying that, uh, you know, if, if I go in and buy Dash now, then I'm supporting the people who might have mined it early. Uh, but there are some assumptions with that. There's an assumption that they kept the amount of Dash and all of that and, um, uh, and some other assumptions with that. Sure. Uh, yeah. So, uh, and it's uh, so Evan. Evan told he was was he asked how many dash he has, or did he, he just no, offer it up? No, it seemed like it was a. They were prepared to uh, announce that Evan owns no more than what two fifty six thousand. He he was asked by someone, <clears throat> excuse me, in the audience that wanted to have clarification on this insta mine because they were looking to invest uh, money in dash, and so <clears throat> they asked, and um, it, w- it was met with a couple little chuckles from the audience, actually, and Amanda called it the token insta mine question, uh, and I guess it's get a- rightfully gets asked very frequently, so th- there's actually a several uh, links where it's been discussed uh, at length, and I- I'll definitely include a-, a link to where all those are linked if you'd like to read more about it, but yeah, Evan immediately just uh, came out and said that he has 256,000 uh, coins to his name personally, and that none of them are tied up in master nodes, uh, so that he's not voting on anything that's uh, in the DAO, uh, in the Dash DAO. So any of the Dash Treasury uh, projects that are being funded, mm-hmm. and that he is going to be donating eighty percent of his whole total holdings uh, towards towards these programs, towards the community programs that are funded by the Dash Treasury. So, well, I mean, that's that's awful nice, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's. Uh... A lot of money, uh, the, but yeah, I mean, people have done analysis of this. There's no way that Evan got all the coins. People have come forward and said that uh, they got some of those and all, all of that. So, okay. so uh, it's it's very clear Evan doesn't have that much. I believe he was honest in stating what his holdings are, and uh, it's going to be interesting to see how uh, millions of dollars are going to be spent. Yes, that's true. It's a lot, worth a lot of money right now. Uh, moving on, there's a really interesting story here, Randy. Uh, some white hat hackers, uh, glasshunt.co. Yeah, so this is actually something that came around in September, and it's kind of flown a little under the radar. Um, it's this website called glasshunt.co, and it's uh, an anonymous collective of hackers. Um, it says it's based in South Korea, but that uh, they're kind of spread across the world and they're only represented by Ethereum smart contracts. So it's a group of hackers that it has bug bounties and they they run a little thing called Hacker School um, where they teach people how to, um, you know, t- t- how to be able to break, um, not break, but how to hack uh, blockchain con- uh, smart contracts and things like that, how to um launch DDoS attacks, how to protect against those kinds of things. Um, but basically, they want to advance the crypto space by making it less likely to attack. And so they have these bug bounties. Now, here's the thing. They have a Bitcoin double spend tool. And what, they, what they've what they done, and maybe, I, I, maybe one of you can better explain a double spend than I can, what actually happens. Uh, anyone? Anyone? Want to oh, take yeah. this one? So a double spend is... Uh, basically, when you make one transaction, perhaps to pay a merchant, uh, and then uh, before it confirms, you make another transaction, perhaps to pay yourself, and um, and it's this double spend is successful if the second transaction confirms before the first one does. Yeah, so they have a tool um, that, again, has been up since around September that 
will let you do this. So you can send, um, th they showed in a video how they did it with Anonymous Casino. They sent a certain amount of Bitcoin to Anonymous Casino. It was a, They picked up the broadcast transaction immediately and granted the coins immediately. And so the guy actually did a couple uh, rounds of roulette with the money and then went back to this double spend tool and put in his uh, address and directed the funds back to him himself himself after he had done a couple rounds on this casino and showed how this can work now this uh glasshunt.co takes 10 percent of what's going back to you and puts it into these bug bounties and like just a few weeks after they launched they actually got hacked and lost about five thousand uh, dollars worth of bitcoin that was in the process of these double spends someone actually like snuck in and took those mm -hmm. um <laughs> but i double spent your double spend. that's right yo dog i heard you like double spends so we How triple much? spent your double wow. spend. <laughs> that's meta that's, it is meta um but this is this address that receives this 10 percent has seen about 63 bitcoin worth of transactions so that you know i don't know if i'm missing something but that would tell me that they've uh overseen 630 bitcoin worth of double spends and that's about Seven hundred and thirteen thousand U.S. dollars as of the time of this writing. Uh, wow! So it's an interesting tool that's out there, and they are posting. Um, they are posting uh, smart contracts and for people to try to crack them. And again, they're bug bounties, um, not just in uh, these virtual currencies, but they also have their own token called, I think, Glass. Um, and if you collect more Glass, you can try additional. Uh, uh, additional smart contracts that they come out with you get like early access to them and all those other wow. strange things but um yeah hopefully it stays more white hat but you that's know, there's it been doesn't 600... sound very white hat actually yeah. actually right now randy it does not sound like a white hat well but that's the thing i mean if we want to have something that is trusted and something where you know merchants if merchants are to trust this they can't have this possibility of double spends sure you know, so anything going through coinbase or any like um uh, any kind of merchant wallet app um, you want to make sure something like instant send on dash or even with the much faster block time of ethereum so uh, uh, so here here's here all, all you the business people and i know we get a lot of listeners in california hopefully you guys are in the silicon valley area anyway ch use this this glass hunt uh thing to check your own uh merchant uh websites and whatnot check yourself check your well, try to double spend yourself so be be the first one to double spend yourself and if it works Figure out how you can uh, prevent it from working in the future. There you go. Um, I, and, they've got a video, and I'll have that up on the blog, neocashradio.com. And that's right, neocashradio.com. And in fact, if you want to send us an email, we love to hear your email. Send it to Darren at neocashradio.com. Don't send it to JJ because JJ he doesn't check his email very well. He's he's really bad at that. Uh, moving on, we've got a lot more to talk about in Ethereum news. Uh, Pedro. Yep. The uh, proof of stake. Proof of stake. So Vitalik Buterin, who is um, the, uh, I would say, founder and visionary for Ethereum, uh, shares Casper contract code. So this is an article from ethnews.com. One of the most anticipated events in the Ethereum ecosystem is a switch from proof of work to proof of stake. Uh, both systems are used to achieve consensus and maintain security of the uh, blockchain. Uh, proof of work uses mining uh, that uses computing resources, but proof of stake is meant to move a system of secure consensus through network participants that put up a stake of their virtual currency. And in return, they're going to get proportional to the amount they staked versus all the coins, uh, rewards for their virtual mining. So the changeover is going to be implemented in sequential steps, transitioning the system to a hybrid proof-of-work and proof-of-stake before going full proof-of-stake. Okay. Uh, so makes um, sense. And this yeah. is and da like dash master nodes are a form of proof of stake. Is it correct? Sure. Okay. Yep. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so what we have is uh, it's going to be done in stages. And what what Buterin did is um, he released what's called the the Castro contract for this. So it's going to be uh, a multi stage roadmap. Uh, and according to Buterin's recent presentation at the Taipei Ethereum meetup, stage one is over three quarters complete. Uh, so right now Ethereum's on the Homestead release. Casper is going to be the next major release, and that's going to be all proof of stake. So that's Metropolis. The next one's Metropolis, and then Serenity is the the fourth one. Is it? Yeah, yeah. So Casper is the uh, oh sorry proof yep. of stake protocol, and uh, that will be part of Metropolis. That's right. Got so it. we're on Homestead, and then Metropolis is the third one, and then Serenity is the the final, and then that's the point at which they say this is like 
that the version one or whatever the singular like the, the singularity has well, been met. They had such a such a, a huge vision for what this platform would do that it, it's going to take a long time to get there. I would be happy if their goal was to set something up and then not touch it. <laughs> not touch it just don't touch it you mean be you like, know what? okay you guys go on like vacation Bitcoin. for a good six uh, months yeah like, like <laughs> yeah just don't touch it i mean like get it set up where it's gonna last and and it well, can here, grow here, and it can scale well here once once it's set, classic once might. it's set you know what that will we could just have them hire the bitcoin core team to come <laughs> over and work on the ethereum dev and yeah. it won't change for at least a year and a half but that's also a, a situation oh. where Ethereum Classic could come into play, right? Oh, I mean, yeah. where if Ethereum kept moving on and some that's, people were like, no, that's yeah, gone well, too I, far, I, we can stop it right here I mean, and some of see this what is happens. hyperbolic saying that I, sure. I want them to never touch it again. <laughs> but it seems like if you could get, just get something set up and your goal should be that you don't need to fiddle with it. Now, clearly, encryption standards change, and at some point, the encryption probably will need to be upgraded. But, uh, you know, basically the goal should be to set something up that doesn't need to be changed. I'm not disagreeing with what Vitalik's doing. I think it's great because he said, hey, I'm going to do this thing. It's got these four stages, you know, and he's holding to that and he's doing that. And it's, this isn't it's a surprise. Incredible. It's, it's very clear he, wasn't, he wouldn't be able to go from zero to 300 overnight. So, um, and, so and we, and we have Ray, Radon coming to Ethereum oh, wow. hopefully in the next couple of months, and that's going to really increase the... You know, transaction scale. Yeah, and you have me come to the Ethereum test net. I, I'm playing around, and I'm so I'm actually scared to send Ethereum to all these fancy things. So I went to the test net, and I'm just playing with it. Okay. Yeah, I learned how uh, contracts are expensive on the test net, but the the test Ethereum is like play money. It's free and cheap sure. and whatever. Is there more you wanted to, to go on about with the Casper? Yeah, sure. So uh, in a very highly transparent mood, you know, Buterin shared this code, um, you know, advanced, which is about, you know, three quarters complete. Now, an another beneficial feature of, um, you know, Casper is the ability to send in a deposit from a contract instead of just your wallet address. So what this allows is a person could withdraw their validator rewards to a contract that only releases the funds back to them if some other set of conditions is met. Now, that's going to allow uh, a person to dual use their Casper deposit as a security deposit in some other application. So even though a validator would need to lock away a fair amount of Ether, they could use it for collateral while it's still virtually mining and getting block rewards. Wow. Well, and it makes sense, though. I mean, you can pull it out. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I have no idea how this works, so I, I'm not even going to say. Yeah, it's, it's, really, it's really cutting edge, and uh, you know, thanks for correcting me on the uh, release name. Oh, that's all good. It's all good. No worries. No, I, it's it's uh, it's it's so complicated. There's so many layers, and and you know what? I'm, I'm looking forward to their their version IPFS. Um, uh, geez, in, in, the, inter, interplanetary file system. Well, it's their. It's not that. It's uh, Swarm. I think it's Swarm. Yeah, Swarm. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. Swarm is their 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 storage decentralized solution. storage. Yeah. So and, and, you know, there's so and, there's and that's, another and, part, and that's where you can get paid to you know host data and that data is going to be encrypted so you don't even know what you're hosting um you know so we have all this now you know peer-to-peer -peer file sharing uh, shards of, encry of encrypted Char data yeah so here's here's why i've always what's really excited me about ethereum we have we've, we've almost never talked about because it's not even it's not really even talked about but part of the original white paper when you go back and read it was mesh networks yeah I think that is huge. Mesh networks with a blockchain where you can have your sort of connectivity there in the blockchain and, and on your computer and your hard drive. And you know what I'm saying? Like all your, your IP addresses and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. And uh, Ethereum's coming out. I, it, it escapes my mind what, what the name is, but they're going to have their own naming system on the Ethereum blockchain. Yep. Yeah. So, so you can you you know you can find servers and, and such just using Ethereum, and that's a huge application, honestly. Uh, the the DNS the d domain name service that the internet uses now, uh, there's there's some big big problems with that, and uh, if you could have an an alternate available, that would be very nice. Wow. Well, uh, I just want to. Well, so what excites you about what excites you about that so much, JJ? Excites me about what about about the the. Mesh networks. Yeah. Well, I mean, we we talked last week about how the ISPs are basically going to be able to sell your browser history. 
So when you're in a mesh network type connection, you're basically, you're, it's not a virtual private uh, uh, network. You know, it's not a, like a, a encrypted tunnel necessarily, but you're going through, I mean, other networks, other routers, other, like you're, you're connecting not necessarily through the, the direct portal of ISP in your house. It's another tool in the toolbox for security and privacy. Not only security and privacy, but just communication. I mean, just the ability, the ability to to have this I mean, additional layer of communication available. People have set these up on their farms so they can, you know, communicate with the sprinklers or whatever, yeah, uh, and and communicate over distances. Uh, but I I, on it, I do believe there's some scaling issues between behind a net mesh network. Oh sure, I, I don't think it's meant to 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 launch a full bandwidth internet. It's no. not you're not going to stream uh, Amazon videos on a mesh network, but you're definitely going to be able to communicate. Yeah, yeah. And you're definitely going to, you know, like be able to to ask for help or whatever, you know. Right, right. So, Very uh, cool. uh brief story real quick, uh Bitfinex has made good on its BFX to- token exchange. So, uh it announced on their blog just recently that uh, after the hack last August, Bitfinex lost around 120,000 Bitcoin. And they responded by giving a 36% haircut across the board to all of their users in exchange for the, the Bitcoins they took. They gave them BFX tokens valued at $1. And, it, you know, at, that, at the current price of Bitcoin. Well, the, the price of Bitcoin at that time was around $615. So they report on their blog that they have finished exchanging those tokens and that there are no more uh, tokens left. So they've paid back, quote-unquote, all of their victims that they took the, Bitcoin from. They've paid them back the value of what those Bitcoins were at the day of the hack. That's right, okay. which was half the value they're worth today. Right. And, and, that, and if, if you were the type of person that didn't move those Bitcoins since that time, then, you know, no loss. In but. fact, they were traded a lot. And some of the trading, the trading ranges that were really heavy were pretty much between, like, 56 and, like, 67 cents or something to that effect. And so and whoever ended up with them and bought them at 56 cents, well, hey, good on you. You just, <laughs> you you at least did did well, but, you know, unfortunately, uh, it is good that they paid back the the uh, the BFX tokens. So I, I do have to at least mention and, and honor that. So uh, slock it, Pedro. Yes. So they, the guys who invented the DAO, <laughs> basically. Yes, I mean. the, the failed DAO. So Slock.it uh, secures $2 million in seed funding for the Universal Sharing Network Protocol. So I think we're going to see a lot of uh, venture capital coming into the, in, into the cryptocurrencies and, and, and other blockchain movement. Excellent. So Slockit received $2 million in seed funding. It's, and what the, the aim is to commoditize underused assets via an Ethereum-based application. So, as shown by the success of several resource-sharing platforms from Airbnb to Zipcar, a share of the population is extremely willing to rent their assets for a premium. This trend signals that the world may be moving from an era of ownership to an era of communal utilization. Uh, The end user would be able to find, locate, rent, and control any object mediated by the uh, USN from anywhere in the world. With the USN, rental apartments and offices would become fully automated. Smart objects will be rented on demand, and used vehicles get a new lease on life. Uh, so the global beta release of the uh, USN is set to uh, launch next year with mainstream user-friendly brand and image, according to them. Excellent. I, I really hope they're successful. I, I know I liked when when I just looked at Slocket sort of right around the time of the DAO and and whatnot. I was doing research, and I you know obviously I'm going to look at who's behind this, right? So I looked in the Slocket. I watched a video on the the whole bike lock thing. I thought that was a really cool idea of having a bike lock, you know, at, on the blockchain, so to speak, where you can uh, authenticate or you can sign something or you can you can verify you're the owner, and it will unlock without yeah. a key, you know. So that sort of stuff, I see a lot of value for that. Not just at bikes, but what about a home lock? You know, like like an Airbnb where you can rent rent your home out. Well, and right. What if your home doesn't have a key lock anymore? You know what I'm saying? Like your it, it just has a transaction. You send you send X amount of funds to this address, and it you not know not even that. You can just sign a message. Yeah, you can oh. just sign a message from that, that that lock pings you with a message that's encrypted that you. Your your app or your your side of it just is like okay I can read this and then I'm gonna send it back to you signed and that's it yeah and 
and you know to protect the property i i, I want to understand better like you know what what do they have as protections for the for the property owner like does that mean the the person that sends over has to be identified or can they stay anonymous you know things like that so it's it's something that um is definitely yeah i would i wouldn't advise of. connecting that to the internet i'm thinking this is a this is a very short range antenna that's sort of bluetooth or uh near field communication near field yeah. communication something like RFID. that that you have to like come up to it and you have to do it with your phone but anyway you know there's there's a lot of different things and maybe you have like a key fob you know what I'm saying? Like a car. You, you trust your car with a key fob. Yeah. And, and and this gets to, you know, down the road, are we really going to are we gonna be registering our cars and houses and other property at the local town office? Or are we going to hash the car's VIN number and that with some token identifies that, you know, you own that car? Sure. Um, you know, I, I think that's that's coming, you know. Well, I mean, with this USN thing, wouldn't that be, you know, advantageous? Then, then you're like, imagine your your app on your phone has this this near field communication that you can sign a message, and then you know it's already rented something for you, 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 and you know you own it for this specific time period, and you can authenticate this message. You go up to the car, you sign the message, the car opens. It's the only way to get in the car. Yep, and then you you use it, and uh, you know, at, at the end of the use, you know, or maybe at the beginning of the use, you, right. you pay the fee. And the property owner gets the funds, and and like let's say you go over in time, and the car's sitting there. All of a sudden, it comes in. It's like warning. You're yeah. you know you're you've extended beyond your contract. And would and you, you wish to negotiate for you know like then you go through that period, and then it, it, ultimately it just the car just shuts off. You I'm wish to like, play another I'm level pull for, for twenty five yeah. cents and continue. I'm gonna pull <laughs> over to the safe the safest location I can find, and I'm gonna stop the vehicle. Well, I hope they've been humbled a little bit. Uh, I really didn't like the way sure. they handled the the Dow, and certainly like the the tweets from uh, Stefan Twal. Is that his name? Yes. Um, okay, yeah, he yeah. was he was pretty irresponsible, and really, it took them a while to take ownership. And so, I, I hope they've been humbled a bit, and I I, I wish them well too. I of course love uh, products that benefit consumers and, that want them. So, wow, wow, Randy, that's uh, wow. Deep thoughts. Deep well, thoughts. Well, uh, you know, Tesla has announced that they're going to have a, pro- a ride-sharing program that's just with with their cars. So you can go to work and then rent out your Tesla. Your Tesla then, by itself, when it's fully automated, will drive, pick up people with no driver in the seat, drop them off, and, and you get paid. And then the car comes back and, you know, maybe goes into the charging station. So when you're done with work, you you know, you have a battery to get home. So that would be, you know, renting out your car instead of it sitting in your, you know, your company's parking lot. Right. Smart. I, I, I really like that about Tesla, too. I mean, I, what I like is the the complete package deal that, that they're putting together. The whole, you have a solar roof, uh, a battery in your wall, and a, a car charger, and your car is electric. So you're basically, like, powering your house from the sun and your car from the sun. I mean, I think that's really, really smart. And then if you can make money on renting your car, you're you're essentially a, a producer, right? right. You you produce energy, and then you produce a product, which is the rental of, of your yeah, car to conveyance. somebody that needs it. Exactly. So we got one more uh, one more story to talk about here. Yeah, just a quick one. This was something I saw um, on DAP Daily talking about a new tool tool called Seed Split. Uh, that would let you split a mnemonic seed into a selected number of shards, which are also encoded as mnemonics. So let me translate that. If you were using a, a hardware wallet like Trezor or Ledger or KeepKey, um, which we've talked about quite a bit on the last several episodes, uh, it gives you a seed phrase, a twelve, sometimes 12 words, sometimes 24. Um, and this seed phrase you can use to um, get access back to your wallet. If Should you ever lose this hardware wallet or uh, lose the private keys somehow, you can use this 12 or 24 word phrase uh, to regain access to your funds. So the problem with that is if you have this piece of paper with, with the magic words on it, someone could identify that and easily gain access to your funds. So this tool called Seed Split um, breaks those mnemonics, breaks that mnemonic seed into a bunch of other parts that you would give out to other people. So maybe this is something for, um, you know, po- we've talked, I think we talked a little bit about, I don't know if it translated onto the show or not. Or no, if we just, I don't think so. Okay. Well, this we, is the first time we're talking about, about it. About postmortem, you know, instructions. If you ever wanted to hand out pieces of your private keys in case something should ever happen to you, um, and, and you wanted to make sure that your family or a trusted friend or partner or whatever had access to your funds after your unfortunate passing, or maybe fortunate, I don't know, maybe you're a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but 
Um, this is a tool you can use so that none of these people individually has any access to your funds, but they together, several of them would have to collude uh, before your death to take the funds uh, pre-mortem. But um, if, if this was something you wanted to, say, give to trusted friends like, hey, this is this is for... Uh, this family member, and if you go to my f good friend Darren here, he can explain exactly what you need to do to make sure the funds get to the right person. Right. So this is a neat tool that's now out there, um, and all the code is, of course, open source, and I advise you to take a look at it yourself. Um, well, I, th I, th I can think of a, a business use for that, like putting things into a trust or putting things into a common deposits or, or an escrow, right? Like like everybody has a portion of the, the passcode, but no one has a single piece. All right, so, say so like you, at the beginning, you all get a piece, and when you're ready, when everybody's ready to come together and, and figure this thing out, then you, you come together and put your thing together. And like, like, like parents that, you know, do a, you know, they each have to sign to release funds from the college fund, for example, right? So then, you know, that way, you know, they both have to be in, in consensus. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that would, that, that's one way in which you would, you know, that would force consensus, which, you know, come to your terms, figure out how to talk to this person long enough to, you know, transact this. And you could also split the key up with multiple attorneys if you didn't trust your family. Well, I mean, and, hopefully, and maybe trust, hopefully it doesn't come to that. Maybe you trust, uh, you know, the three attorneys, as long as one of them's honest, you're okay. Well, another thing to think about is you may very well trust your family, but you might not trust yourself, right? Say down the road, you get hacked. Oh, okay. okay. So you had bad security. Yeah. So do, was it your family that had access to it if they got together or was, did you really get hacked? So, so one thing that I think about is I don't try to give one person this. I don't you know, so they do the share. I actually gave my parents a flash drive mm -hmm. and they have instru instructions on who to give it to, uh, in, in case of my demise, uh, um, and the, and it's encrypted to the person they're supposed to give it to. Okay. So, uh, so that way, uh, I'm pr fairly certain that my parents aren't going to give it to one of my friends, you know, half a world away. So, uh, with without them supposed to do it. Anyway, so I, I feel pretty secure in that type setup as well. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, hey, you know, this is one of the longest shows we've done, uh, gentlemen. Uh, we're over the fifty minute mark. It's pretty I, good. And there's still so so darn much to talk about. What, what do you want to talk about, Randy? Oh, well, there's always stuff, but I just in keeping with hardware wallets, I guess, <clears throat> excuse me, Pedro had talked to me a little earlier in the week about uh, the ability to purchase Ethereum-based tokens and st and store them on something like uh, a Ledger wallet using uh, this web-based client-side Ethereum wallet called MyEtherWallet.com. And basically, it can interact with... Um, I used it with a Ledger just to see how it worked, but I think it can also do with the, the Trezor. And essentially, um, it allowed me to work with a decentralized uh, exchange, which operated a smart contract to transfer tokens onto my ledger. So you send the money. Yeah, that, that was that was pretty cool to, to, to find, and I was surprised at how easy it was to use. And it's fast. It's so fast. Like, just watching in a couple seconds from... From the Ethereum, like the little bit of Ethereum I used and to test it out to to send to this listed address that you can read all the I mean, I don't understand what any of this stuff means, but it says what it's going to do. And there's a little check mark next to the code. And if I was a coder, I'd understand some of it. But, you know, I tested a very, very small amount, the smallest amount I could to see what would happen. And sure enough, I got like a, a couple of uh, the Gollum tokens just to see it work. Um, but yeah, it's neat. So it's not something that I, it, it, basically you, there's a couple of blog posts and I, I can include them or maybe I'll do it as a separate blog post on oh, eocashradio.com yeah. cause I don't want to type that much tonight. That, excellent. But we'll, we'll have a separate blog post about how you can do this if you have a ledger, but uh, it was just really something neat. And, I, um, yeah, the other cool thing is your fun, your, the, the rest of the ether and those Gollum tokens are still secure on that ledger. Right. So I, I, I tried to do a, a transaction um, by sending, you know, a little bit of ether to the Ethereum wallet, and then from there using Shapeshift, I'm like, okay, well, I, you know, I can get Gollum tokens that way. But with, but with the ledger, that that ether all and the private key for that account all stays on on the device. And I was really surprised at how easy it was to do and how fast. You know, to your point, you refresh the web page and you're like, wow, you know, there they are. About a half a minute later. Wow. 
Yeah, with with confirmations already. Yeah, it's um, I, I'm I'm really uh, happy with with the ledger. So um, an, another point about that device is a few weeks back, I was interacting with it, and it said, "Oh, you still have some, you know, Ethereum Classic, you know, uh, funds here." And there wasn't a way that I could see it, you know, to get get to them other than from their web page saying, "Send us an email." So I'm like, "All right, well, let me give this a try." Send them an email. Like 50 minutes later, I get an email from France. Right. Go here, download this alternate wallet, do these steps, and it. it I was just surprised at how uh, reactive they were, you know, to, to respond, and it it just worked. It was a, a very clear write up from them. So nice. I've been impressed with that wallet. Excellent. Well, it's good to hear. I mean, uh, I, I, I hopefully this uh, sphere, the area of wallets, really progresses. In fact, we saw just earlier um, a, a friend of ours came over. And showed us one of these, um, the crypto steel. Yeah, crypto steel. Some wallet that you, you basically it's not, it's just a passphrase that you can you can store somewhere and you can lock it up and it, and, and it's metal is yeah, it's, it's one a of, heavy it's very durable. It's, it's a heavy chunk of steel that they send you with letters that you put that you put in place for like a seed. You can put a whole seed phrase in there or a private key, um, but you basically spell it out with these steel letters it, and you seal it. Uh, it's you know, fire resistant, water resistant, rust resistant, and um, yeah, you, it was. This was sealed with like a cargo lock um, that would basically show any time it had been altered, and it, this lock had a serial number from a company that wow. like, didn't repeat serial numbers on their locks. Um, and so, but this is something you know, talking about like burying a seed or bur- burying seed money, but back the old style way of putting yeah. it in your backyard or it, it reminds me of the old style printing presses that you'd have to you yeah. know, put the letters together yeah. and put a block excellent well those and those are uh, yeah it's called crypto steel they're pretty neat yeah so there's a lot i mean this is just the beginning just the beginning we could talk all night we could but we won't that pedro <laughs> thanks again for joining us here on neo cash radio as always it's a pleasure all right and for the, we've we've got so much more to talk about but of course there's always next week you can Next tune in Wednesday. Every, every Wednesday for Neo Cash Radio. In the studio with you, it's JJ, Darren, and Randy for Neo Cash Radio, where we discuss the future of money today. Mm-hmm.